We are praying and fasting because there are some things that happen when we pray and fast that don't happen when we don't. And uh, I just want to encourage you, if, if you haven't joined in, well, just jump on in now. And uh, if you uh, somewhere along the way got weary and took a break, well, that's okay. Just jump back in, all right? But all of us, we are praying and fasting for a reason. We need to keep our eyes on the prize. We are believing for more intimacy with the Lord just to draw near to Him. And we are believing for our faith to rise to a new level as we pray and fast. And we're believing that during this time, we're just going to be, become more and more sensitive to the Holy Spirit, to His leading and His direction, that we truly walk in the Spirit, as the Bible says that we're supposed to. And all of that has to do with us bringing our body under subjection so that we can really draw near to Him and not be distracted by other things. Fasting is a discipline that, uh, well, first of all, let me just pause and say this. Somebody needs to hear this. I realize that this sounds weird in the religious culture of the day when we talk about fasting, but it is so scriptural and so biblical, and we need to not be afraid of the things the Bible talks about. But it is a way for us to set aside food, maybe entertainment, and anything else that keeps us from really focusing on God. You see, a lot of the time, those things dull our appetite and our hunger for God. And so we set those things aside so that we can really focus on Him. You know, if after the service today you got home and you found out that somewhere in your house was hidden $10 million, and when you found it, it was all going to be rightfully and legally yours, uh, I don't think that you would lay down for a Sunday afternoon nap. In fact, I think you would probably skip your ball team, you're watching the ball game or whatever other show, and you probably would forego, you know, getting on social media, and you probably wouldn't even think about supper until you had found that $10 million. I mean, it, you'd start taking that house apart piece by piece, brick by brick if you had to, but you'd be like, I'm finding that $10 million. That's the way we want to be about the Lord. Whatever it takes. We say, why would we be that way over $10 million and not be that way over our relationship with God? And I want, I want to seek Him with all my heart. And I'll find Him. We, just, we need that kind of passion. And so, you know, that's why we fast. Listen, here's something else I want to share with you about that. Matthew 6 16 through 18, Jesus talks about fasting. He says, moreover, when you fast, by the way, he doesn't say, uh, you guys don't need to fast. He says, when you fast, do not be like the hypocrites with a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces that they may appear to men to be fasting. But assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But you, when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face so that you do not appear to men to be fasting but to your father who sees in the secret place and your father who sees in the secret place will reward you openly now first of all he gives us some instruction here that certainly we need to do this sincerely we're doing this to seek god to draw near to him we're not doing this to look spiritual to be religious or to get some kind of approval from other people. Oh, did you know I'm fast? Listen, we're not doing it for that reason. It's a matter of the heart. It's the motive behind why you fast. I want you to understand there's nothing wrong with us talking about fasting as a church. We're doing this together, and that's biblical. When Joshua and the, uh, Jehoshaphat and the children of Israel faced a great battle, Jehoshaphat called the people to a time of prayer and fasting. And God brought a mighty deliverance for them. And we all have battles that need to be won. And so we're starting this year off with 21 days of fasting and prayer. But I want to say one more thing. He rewards openly. That means everybody sees it. You see, we pray and fast in secret, but God rewards openly. You know, sometimes we might look at somebody else's life and we might think, well... Man, aren't they the lucky one? Why, why are they so blessed? We see favor on their life, and we question that. 
We don't understand. But you see, we don't see everything. God does. He sees what's done in secret, and He rewards where everybody sees it. So I just want to tell you, keep your eyes on the prize. Keep seeking the Lord, as He rewards. Amen. Let's pray and open our heart. Oh, that was the message before the message, by the way. Sorry. But you get, you get a two for today, so we're going to pray. I believe God has a word for us this morning. Father, I just thank you for your word. I know that it speaks to us, to our generation. Lord, it is powerful and alive, and it divides asunder between soul and spirit. It discerns the thoughts and intents of the heart. And Father, I just pray that today your word will be preached boldly and clearly. Lord, that you'd help me to say exactly what you'd have me to, and that you would be glorified in it, your people would be blessed in it. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. Well... Last week I shared a message with you about choosing to make the Lord your first love. When we truly love Him first, then we put Him first in our lives. We don't allow anything to come between us and God. We don't put anything before the Lord. He's first. And when He is truly first in our lives, we give to God first. Oh, it's really quiet in here right now. That's okay. We're going to make it. But I want to remind you this morning that Jesus said, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. These are the words of Jesus in Matthew 6, 21. Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. You see, He wants all of our hearts. Not just a little bit, not just most of it, 90%. He wants all of our hearts. And Jesus knows that this is really a heart issue. We need to understand this. Part of the reason why it's such a touchy subject, it's a a heart issue. And amazingly, there's over 2,000 verses of Scripture that in one way or another speak of or deal with the issue of money. That's a whole lot of Scripture. It's all through the Bible. And sometimes preachers like myself seem to do a pretty good job of of ignoring a lot of those Scriptures. People don't like it when preachers talk about money. And I don't like to do it. But I'm not going to allow that attitude. Because I know that God's people need God's word. And a lot of people are bound up in this area. And they need to be free. A lot of people are deceived in this area. And they need to know the truth. You know, when I pastored... A small church years ago, after I'd been preaching there a few months, I had some people come to me, spiritual people in the church, and they said, oh, we just love your preaching. They said, our former pastor, he just talked about tithing all the time. Now I want you to know, something like that can kind of make an impression on a young man. I want people to like my preaching. So I'm just not going to talk about that. But I'm telling you, sometimes it's just exactly what people need. And not everybody's going to like it. But i got to tell you that they wouldn't have liked the Jesus preaching because he talked about it way more than most preachers today do. And we need to understand that. And the reason is, is because so much is an issue of the heart. And if our hearts aren't really right in the area of money and possessions and stuff, they're just not right. we have on our money in God we trust. And how wonderful that is to always be a reminder to us. Some of you, you didn't know it was on there. It's on there. But (laughs) it's a wonderful thing. The problem is, is that for so many people, whether they realize it or not, money becomes their God. And they put their trust. They think money is the answer. And their lives show that in the way they live their life and they conduct business and the things that they pursue after. The Bible tells us that the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. It's okay to have money. You're just not supposed to love it. God wants to be our first love. But that is, of all the things, that is the one thing that so often that people put before God and put their trust in. We shouldn't think that we... Love the Lord first. 
and that he's truly first in our lives if we're not willing to give to him first. It's evidenced, you see, by how we live and the things that we do. It's not just something that we talk. It's something we live out. A lot of people say things like, well, it's my money. I can do whatever I want with it. Well, first of all, I just want to tell you that the Scripture says the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. And I'm pretty sure that includes you and me and all of our stuff. And if you read the back of the book, you find out that one day it's all going to burn. Heaven and earth are going to pass away. There's going to be a new heaven and earth. All this is going to be gone. All this stuff that people are chasing after is going to be gone. We're going to be with Him for eternity. But the earth is the Lord's, the fullness thereof. It all ultimately belongs to God. We just get to be stewards over a little bit of it for a little while. What kind of stewards are we? But the tithe, the first tenth, is holy because it belongs to the Lord. Whatever belongs to him is holy. The tithe is holy to the Lord. We're not going to spend a lot of time here, but I want to start with Malachi chapter 3, and verse 8. And if you know the passage, you've heard it, you've already decided, I'm not listening to what this preacher has to say, I would just encourage you just to open your heart to the word of the Lord and the Holy Spirit and just allow God to speak to your heart. Here's what it says. It says, will a man rob God? He says, yet you have robbed me. But you say, in what way have we robbed you? He says, in tithes and offerings, you're cursed with a curse, for you've robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse. And see, when we bring the tithe, we're really just giving God what rightfully already belongs to him. It's not ours. He says it's his. He says that there may be food in my house, and try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts. If I, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such blessings that there will not be room enough to receive it, and I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes so that he will not destroy the fruit of your ground, nor shall the vine fail to bear fruit for you in the field, says the Lord of hosts. The reason that many don't believe in tithing is because they don't believe that the promise is for them. Because if you believe that the promise goes with this command, everybody would want in on this deal. That he's going to bless you until it just overflows. You'll not be able to contain it. He's going to rebuke the devourer for your sake. That your efforts and your work, it's going to be fruitful. I'm just telling you, Everybody would want in on this deal. The real reason that people say, oh, I don't believe in tithing is because they don't believe the promise. What a sad time we live in where the religious culture of the day is trying to tell us that so many of the promises... Let's just start with pretty much the whole Old Testament. That's Old Testament. And even a lot of the promises that Jesus made, well, that was before the cross. They just do away with all the promises of God and say, oh, that's not for us. Even promises after the cross, well, that was only for the apostles. I'm telling you, this promise is for us. But you can't just take the promise. It has a condition. And we have to obey the word of God. There's something powerful for us here We need to get a hold of this. You see, people say, well, I'm not under law. I'm under grace. Oh, that is absolutely true. The Ten Commandments are part of the law. One of those says, you shall not steal. How would you feel if your neighbor says, hey, I'm not under law. I'm under grace. I can take whatever of yours I want. That's crazy. We're not going to put up with that. Thou shalt shalt not commit adultery. I'm not under the law. I'm under grace. You see how far you get with that with your spouse. I'm just saying. You see, we know. The Bible says we're not supposed to murder. 
That's one of the big ten. Thou shalt not kill. I'm not under the law. You better not make me mad. What an abuse of Scripture to say that because we're not under the law, we don't have to obey the commands. What kind of hypocrisy is that? No, we're not under the law. We are under grace. But that is not an excuse. It is not some religious rationalization for not obeying God. In fact, grace goes further than the law. John chapter 1 tells us that Jesus was full of grace and truth. Not a little bit. He was full of grace and truth. He's the embodiment of grace and truth. And listen to what Jesus says in Matthew 5, 17. Before I read it, let's just, let's just settle this. Uh, do you believe that the teachings of Jesus are for us? I don't know how anybody claims to follow Jesus and says, oh, well, his teachings aren't for us. That's just crazy. If we claim to be followers of Christ, his disciples, then we learn from him, then we certainly take to heart the teachings of Jesus. And listen to what Jesus says here. He says, do not think that I came to destroy the law and the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For assuredly, I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away. When? Till heaven and earth pass away. That's not yet. We're not there. Heaven and earth have not passed away. One jot. Or one tittle will by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. Whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does does and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say to you that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Our righteousness has to exceed that of the Pharisees. Now, we all know that we are not made righteous by the works of the law. We are made righteous by faith. Our faith is in Jesus Christ and the price that he paid for us, and that makes us righteous because we believe, not because of the works of the law. But that doesn't mean that we don't obey God. We've been empowered by grace to live in righteousness, to do what he wants us to do, and to serve him with a whole heart. In the very next verse, you see, this isn't some obscure thing we're connecting here. The very next verse, Jesus illustrates this principle for us. Matthew 5, 21, he says, You have heard that it was said of those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be in danger of the judgment. Where have you heard that? Well, we just talked about it. It's in the law. But Jesus always wants to deal with the heart. I say to you, whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in in danger of the judgment. You see, Jesus raises the bar. He takes it further. That's grace. Grace doesn't lower the bar. Grace doesn't say, oh, I'm under grace, so I don't have to obey God anymore. No, grace takes it further because it deals with the heart. It's not enough to just go through the motions on the outside. He wants to deal with the heart. A few verses later, verse 27 and 28, he says, You've heard that it was said of those of old, you shall not commit adultery. We've all heard that. We just read it a few months ago. It's part of the law. But I say to you that whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. These are the words of Jesus. It just flies in the face of the time in which we live. But if a man, Jesus said, if a man looks at a woman with this intent, with this motive to lust for her, he's already committed adultery in his heart. You see, Jesus raises the bar. It goes so much further. It's not enough to just not commit adultery. Jesus says, you're not even to look at a woman with lust in your heart. That's grace. That's where grace takes us. That's where the teachings of Jesus take us. Take us, the one who is full of grace and truth. And how that speaks to our generation where pornography has become such a God and a bondage in so many people's lives. Jesus wants people to be free. Grace is to set us free, not to allow us to stay in the bondage of sin. Paul said, God forbid, how can we stay in it any longer? 
Grace doesn't mean we don't do right. It means we can live right above the bare minimum of the law. One last example with Jesus in Matthew 5, 33 and 34. He says, you've heard that it was said of those of old, you shall not swear falsely, but shall perform your oaths to the Lord. You make a vow, you keep it. But he says, I say to you, do not swear at all. Again, Jesus raises the bar. Grace goes above and beyond the law. So when someone says they're not under the law, but under grace in regard to giving, I take that to mean that they go above and beyond the tithe. Because surely they do not use that. They don't use grace as an excuse to be stingy in their giving. The Bible says... He that sows stingily shall reap stingily. Yes, it does. It's right there. 2 Corinthians 9, 6. He who sows sparingly. That's the same thing. Don't be stingy with God. He who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And he that sows bountifully, generously, he's going to reap bountifully, generously. That's the Word of God. It's not some thing, some preacher made up trying to get your money. It's the Word of God. There's freedom when you know the truth. And we need to know the truth about money so we can be free. And you're not going to get it from the world. Tithing was before the law. And it was after, and it is after, the law. Genesis 28, 22. Listen to what Jacob said 500 years before the law. See, everybody always wants to talk about the law. Well, this was 500 years before the law. Jacob has an encounter with the Lord. He realizes that the presence of God is there. And he says this, and this stone which I have set as a pillar shall be God's house, and of all that you give me, I will surely give a tenth to you. This was a, a commitment that Jacob made that he was going to give a tenth to God of everything that God blessed him with. Now, I'm not going to take a lot of time here, but I just want you to understand the story a little bit that because Jacob had deceived his father and gotten the elder brother blessing. His older brother Esau wants to kill him, and so Jacob is fleeing for his life, and he's, he's left home with virtually nothing, and he goes and he works for his uncle Laban, and there's a whole lot of story there I'm not going to get into, but the Bible tells us this, that Jacob said that uncle Laban had cheated him and changed his wages ten times. You know, in this life, there's a lot of people that will cheat you, take advantage of you, and maybe even change your wages. I had that happen to me before. Some of you say, oh yeah, well I have to work in the secular field. Well, that was a pastor that changed my wages. But anyway, I'm just telling you, God blessed him in spite of all of that. And 20 years later, when he's finally going home, he prays and he tells the Lord, he says... When I crossed this Jordan, I came across this Jordan with only my staff. And now I have become two companies of people. I'm not worthy of the least of the mercy and truth that you've shown to me. That's how much God had blessed him. Let's go back another 50 years or so and you find... Abraham, 550 years before the law, Genesis 14, 18 through 20. Now, this is after Abraham had defeated those enemies, those kings who had kidnapped his nephew Lot and their family. Here's what it says. It says, Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine, and he was the priest of God Most High, and he blessed him and said... Blessed be Abram of God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And Abraham gave him a tithe of all. Abraham gives him a tenth 
of all of the spoils that he had gained. 550 years before the law, how is it that we think that this is not available and for us? These men were rich. The Bible says that God made Abraham very rich. Remember, in this time, not very many people were rich. It's not like our country today. Not very many people were rich. But these men made a commitment to put God first by giving God a tithe of their increase. Abraham was so rich, even his servants were blessed. Genesis chapter 4. Now this is 2,500 years before the law was ever given. Beginning in verse 1, it says, Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain and and said, I've acquired a man from the Lord. Then she bore again, this time his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And notice the wording in the next verse. It says, and in the process of time, Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat. And the Lord respected Abel and his offering, but he did not respect Cain and his offering. And Cain was very angry and his countenance fell. See, somehow they knew, we don't really know how, but somehow they knew that the Lord was pleased with Abel's offering and he was not pleased with Cain's. He rejected it. Verse 6, so the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? A lot of people angry at God this time. Why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? The Lord just tells him, hey, if you'll just do right, you're going to, you know, everything's going to be good. Just do what you're supposed to. He says, and if you do not do well, sin lies at the door and its desire is for you, but you should rule over it. Now Cain talked with Abel, his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and it killed him. Both brothers gave an offering. One pleased the Lord and one didn't. There are people today, the same situation happens where one person brings an offering and the Lord is pleased with it. Another person brings an offering and it is rejected. The Lord does not accept it. One person is blessed and one is not. And some of you are thinking, oh, but that doesn't sound right to me. We just read it. Because God cares about the heart. It's not just about going through the motions. It's about the motives. It's about whether or not we really trust God and put God first. It's about faith. Whether we believe that we can trust God and put God first. Cain brought an offering in the process of time. And that is exactly the way a lot of people give. Somewhere in the course of time they say... You know, hey, let's go to church. And you know what? I think I'm going to give an offering today. I'm going to give this. Somewhere in the course of time, they brought an offering. That is not what happened with Abel. Abel brought the firstborn of his flock. He didn't wait till he had 10 or 15 or 20. He brought the firstborn. That's faith. And I don't know if you caught this or not when we read it, but he brought the firstborn and of their fat. Now, we might not understand this, but to them, the fat was the best part. He brought the first and the best, and he offered it to God. And it was faith and trusting God that he brought the first, not the last, not the leftovers, not we'll wait and see, And it pleased the Lord. It was an act of faith. Cain didn't bring the first fruits of his crop. He just brought an offering. Exodus 23 and 19, it tells us this, The first of the first fruits of your land you shall bring into the house of the Lord your God. In Proverbs 3, 9, it says, Honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruits of all your increase. So however, 
we receive income, we're supposed to give the Lord the first fruits of our income. The Lord told Cain very plainly, if you'll do right, everything's going to be okay. But Cain refused to do it God's way. Here's a stupid way to live your life. The words of Elvis. I did it my way. How much better to do it God's way? I mean, God even spoke to Cain and said, do it like this, Cain, you're not doing right. If you'll do right. And it's still the same today. People want to do it their way instead of doing it God's way. That attitude is still so common. I give my money. It's my money. It's my money. It's my money. I'll give my money when I want to, how I want to. In the process of time, I'm going to bring an offering. But it doesn't really please the Lord. The Lord wants our faith. He wants our trust. He wants us to give Him and put Him truly first. See, it made, made Cain bitter that he wasn't as blessed as Abel. That he didn't receive, that, you know, that he, his offering wasn't accepted like Abel's was. And he blamed. Somehow he blamed Abel. Made him mad at Abel. And he killed his brother. And you know what? We can blame other people. We can blame the government. We can blame the economy. We can blame our boss. You can even blame the pastor. But the truth is, is that we just got to do what God wants us to do we got to give Him our faith and trust. And if you feel like you're not being blessed, go to the Lord. I tell you, God can speak to you just like He did Cain, but don't be like Cain and refuse to listen. So many get mad even at God when things don't go right for them. Proverbs 19 and 3 in the NIV says, A man's own folly ruins his life, and yet his heart rages against the Lord. Sometimes it sounds like people are questioning why God bothered to give them a free will, you know. Because we get ourselves in a mess and then too often people want to blame God. But Cain's sacrifice wasn't really a sacrifice. It was just an offering. Not an act of faith. He just brought some. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 4 refers back to this story. And by the way, you see the Old Testament quoted and spoken of all the time in the New Testament. We don't throw away the Old Testament. We learn from the Old Testament. There's powerful principles there that we're to live by. It says, by faith, Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and through it, he being dead still speaks. Now here's what it says, by faith. Abel offered a better, a more excellent sacrifice. How did he do it? By faith. You see, what he gave as the first fruit, the firstborn, gave the fat. He gave the first and the very best he had. That was an act of faith. And every time we give, it should be an act of faith that we are trusting our Heavenly Father who said, you don't need to worry. I'm going to take care of you. Seek first the kingdom and His righteousness and all these other things will be added to you. See, this principle is all through the Scripture. We put God first and we truly give Him first. He takes care of us. Hebrews eleven six, 6, just two verses later, says, Without faith it's impossible to please Him. Cain didn't really believe and trust God. Even when God spoke to him personally, he didn't believe. It takes faith to give God the first and the best. It doesn't take any faith to pay all your bills and do everything else you want, and then if you got some left over, you're going to give some to God. That doesn't take any faith at all. It takes faith to give God the first and the best. Here's the rest of the story with Cain. Genesis 4, 9 through 11. We'll actually go to 12. But it says, Then the Lord said to Cain, 
where is Abel your brother when the Lord asks a question of you? By the way, it, he's not because he doesn't know the answer. I've heard some people are so biblically illiterate and ignorant that they think when God asks a question, he doesn't know. God knows the answer when he asks you a question. Where is your brother? He said, I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? More biblical illiteracy and ignorance. I've heard people using that as some kind of a justification. Am I my brother's keeper? You're quoting Cain the murderer. We are our brother's keeper. We're supposed to help each other, take care of each other. And he said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. So now you are cursed from the earth, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. I want to tell you, even in judgment, the Lord was merciful to Cain. He deserved to die. But the Lord showed him mercy. And I want to read verse 12 from the NIV. It says, when you work the ground. You see, that's how he made his living. He says, when you work the ground, it will no longer yield its crops for you. The thing that he had put his trust in, God took it away. He says, you will be a restless wanderer on the earth. A restless wanderer. And I want to tell you, when God is not first, we can't find real peace. We can't find real satisfaction, fulfillment. We can't find rest when he's not first. So we give to God first. How can you have the blessing of God on all of your finances? You give God the first and he blesses the rest. And we're going to look at Exodus chapter 13. And there's a principle here that we're going to talk about. I'm just going to give you a warning. It's really kind of strange, all right? And I want to say, and this doesn't apply just to this. This applies to all of the ceremonial law. We don't live by the ceremonial law in the Old Testament. The New Testament makes that clear. I don't want anybody bringing a lamb down here to slaughter it. And don't bring any grain offerings in. We're not living by the ceremonial law. But we are to learn the spirit of the law. There's a reason that those things were written. To teach us and to show us. Well, here we go. Exodus 3, beginning with 1 and 2. It says, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Consecrate to me all the firstborn, whatever opens the womb among the children of Israel, both man and beast, it is mine. It's holy. It's to be set apart for the Lord. Then in verse 11 through 13, he says, And it shall be when the Lord brings you into the land of the Canaanites, as he swore to you and your fathers and gives it to you, that you shall set apart to the Lord all that open the womb, that is, every firstborn that comes from an animal which you have, the males shall be the Lord's, but every firstborn of a donkey... You shall redeem with a lamb. And if you will not redeem it, then you shall break its neck. Why are we reading this weird, horrible passage of Scripture talking about breaking a donkey's neck? We need to understand, first of all, that a donkey was an unclean animal. You couldn't sacrifice a donkey to the Lord. And so they had to bring a lamb in its place. And when they brought that lamb and it was sacrificed to the Lord, it redeemed the donkey. And the principle we need to understand is that when we bring that, that which is holy to the Lord and we give it to Him, He blesses the rest. It belongs to Him. And we put Him first by giving to Him first. Proverbs 3, 9, and 10. Honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruits of all your increase. And here's the result. So your barns will be filled with plenty. Your vats will overflow with new wine. Your bank account... Now listen, I don't think this is just about money. I think this is about the blessings of God on your whole life. But understand the principle here is that when we give the Lord the first fruits of all our increase, then there's going to be plenty then there's going to be abundance. Then there's going to be overflow. When there's overflow, you are being a blessing to other people. It's not just for you. Overflow. It's for others. 
Plenty and overflow. That sounds really good to me, but I'm telling you that that doesn't happen when we're not faithful to trust God in our finances. I'm just going to share this story. I believe it will help somebody. But when I started in ministry as a youth pastor in 1981, um, I was so good at what I did, I was paid zero dollars. And for three months, I worked as a youth pastor for zero pay. And then after that three-month period, they decided to start paying me $100 a week if I would also clean the church. And so I cleaned the church and made my $100 a week, and I gave my $10 tithe every week. It never even crossed my mind. I didn't even have to think about it. I just knew that it was what I was supposed to do, and so I started tithing $10 on $100. Some of you think, when I get more money, I'll tithe. Probably not. And some of you that got a lot of money, you're thinking, I ain't giving that much money. God makes it real simple. You give 10% of your increase, that's a tithe, that's a tenth. So sometime later, I got engaged, and I knew that I couldn't support a wife even in 1981 on $100. And so I went to a bank and got a second job. And the church board didn't really like that, and so they got together and they told me, they said, all right, well, we're going to give you a $100 raise. You're going to make 200 a week now, but you got to do the yard too, by the way. So, man, I am, my, my income has just doubled. I'm really moving along. But you know what? I immediately gave God 10% of every paycheck. Now, I want to tell you, the Lord has really blessed me over the years. I've come a long way since then. But there were some times that it wasn't always easy. One time I was in between positions for five months. Got a wife and two kids. Carmen wasn't working then. Ministers can't draw unemployment. I mean, when you're unemployed, you're just unemployed. There ain't no unemployment. You're on your own. I preached somewhere most Sundays, and I did all kinds of odd jobs. I mean, I can mow pasture in case you want to know, just saying. But here's the important thing. However much we made during that time, we tithed. And we were blessed. God took care of us. We didn't, we weren't struggling. We weren't, we weren't afraid. We weren't stressed out. God took care of us. And what I'm saying to you is that this is not something that's just for the rich. This isn't just for the lucky ones. This is for all of us that our Heavenly Father will take care of us if we truly put Him first. And if he's first in our finances, we'll give him the first. By the way, he's got to throw it in. They say you really got saved when the wallet got saved. Just saying. But you put him first by giving him the first. When we do it God's way, then our finances have his blessing on it. Haggai says that when we don't, It's like earning wages and putting them in a bag with holes in it. And that's where a lot of people live. And that's not God's plan. Where you you get to the end of the month and you say, where'd the money go? You got a hole in your bag. No, we need the blessing of God. And we just need to trust Him that He will take care of us. You say, well... How can I tithe when I already don't have any money? It's a matter of trust between you and God. That you put Him first and you trust Him in that. God always expects, demands the first. But it belongs to God. So you don't give God your leftovers. You give Him the first, the first of your life. When the children of Israel went into the promised land... The first city that they came to was the great walled city of Jericho. And we know that God brought the walls down miraculously as the people obeyed God. And they had a great victory there. Then they go on to the next city, a much smaller city. It should have been an easy victory for them. The city of Ai and they lose. And they try again and they lose again. Finally, they figure out, well, something must be wrong. They go seek the Lord, and they find out what had happened. You see, God had told them when they won their victory in Jericho not to touch any of the spoils. It was normal whenever 
one people conquered a city that they would take the spoils, all of the treasures. But God told them not to take any of them, that they, were, they belonged to the Lord. But there was one man named Achan who took some of the treasures and hid them. And because of that, the children of Israel lost that battle to Ai. Once they realized what had happened, they dealt with the sin, and then they easily defeated Ai. And God gave them the spoils from all of the rest of the cities, all of the rest of their battles and victories. They won every one, and God blessed them. He allowed them to take the spoils. But understand this, the first one belonged to the Lord. They were not to touch it. When we give God the first, it redeems the rest of it. And I want to say again, he's not after your money. He's after your heart. People say, Pastor, you know, all that stuff you're talking about, that's all Old Testament. Listen, if I was preaching about prayer, and I was telling you about the woman Hannah and how she prayed for a son, and how, the, you know, her lips were moving, and all, t- nobody would say, hey, that's Old Testament, Pastor. Don't talk to us about that. If I was telling you about the father of faith, Abraham, and how he got a word from God, he was going to be the father of many nations, and how he went for 25 years believing the one that had promised him was faithful, that he would keep. Nobody would say to me, now wait a minute, Pastor, that's Old Testament. Why is it that people cry Old Testament when you're talking about money? And if you read the Bible, if you read the promises of the Scripture, I'm telling you, I want those promises. No good thing will he withhold from them who walk uprightly. I want that promise. And we can't just pick and choose which parts we like. No, people get kind of weird when you're talking about money. So let's go to the New Testament. Let's forget about that's Old Testament. Here's what Jesus said about the tithe, Luke 11, 42 and 43. Jesus says, Woe to you, Pharisees, for you tithe the mint and rue and all manner of herbs and pass by justice and the love of God. These you ought to have done. Yes, justice and love we are supposed to do. But here's what he says, without leaving the others undone. He didn't say, hey, if you guys will just focus on love and justice, you can forget about that stuff. That's not what he said. He said, without leaving the others undone. There's a lot of people today that leave the others undone. Hebrews 7, beginning from verse 1. For this Melchizedek, remember we read this story in Genesis. This Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of most high God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being translated king of righteousness, then king of Salem, meaning king of peace, without father, see, who is this priest? Without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like the Son of God, remains a priest continually. So this was either an Old Testament vision, Old Testament representation of Jesus or it was somebody representing him but my personal opinion is this is an Old Testament appearance of Jesus it says he has no beginning or end but verse 4 says now consider how great this man was to whom even the patriarch Abraham gave a tenth of the spoils And indeed, those who are of the sons of Levi, who received the priesthood, have a commandment to receive tithes from the people according to the law, that is, from their brethren, though they have come from the loins of Abraham. But he whose genealogy is not derived from from them received tithes from Abraham and blessed him who had the promises. Now, beyond all contradiction, the lesser is blessed by the greater. Abraham was blessed by the greater, yet it was Abraham who presented the tithe to him. Jesus said that. It's more blessed to give than to receive. But verse 8, I want you to get this. Here, mortal men receive tithes. Yes, we bring them to a church. We give them to mortal men. 
But there he receives them, of whom it is witnessed that he lives. This is not past tense. This is not something that happened in the Old Testament. No. Under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the writer of Hebrews says, Here we give tithes to mortal men, but there they're received by him that still lives. And I just want to encourage you. Yes, your giving is always between you and God. It's a personal thing. It's a matter of the heart. It goes deep. And I just want to tell you, if you're not there where well, you can just say, yes, I believe, what that, I believe that sermon, I believe all those scriptures, I understand. Listen, if you're not there yet, then at least do this. Walk in the light that you have, the revelation, the understanding that you have, but keep your heart open to God and don't resist Him. Don't be like Cain and refuse to listen to Him if He speaks to you. But just obey God. And here's the most important thing. God is after our hearts. Don't let anything come between you and the Lord. Always put Him first in every part of your life. This particular area just happens to be a great stronghold and a great problem for so many people. And I believe especially in our generation. Stand with me. We're going to pray. I'd like for our prayer partners to come. We're going to pray. Father, I just thank You that You love us so much. Lord reminded me of the rich young ruler who comes to Jesus and he's telling Jesus about all the how he's kept the commands and done this and done that and the scripture just says and Jesus looked at him and loved him he looked at him and loved him I don't know how they knew that. How, but that's what the scripture says. He looked at him and loved him. And he says to him, one thing you lack. Go sell what you have. Give to the poor and come follow me. And the man went away sad because he had great possessions. And I just want you to know, he loves you. He loves you. He wants you to know he loves you. He's for you. He's not trying to take from you, cheat you. He wants to be your first love. Father, I just pray you have your way in every heart and life that you would be glorified. Help us, Father, to know, to hear, to receive. Lord, where we need to make changes in our lives. We love you, Lord. Help us to love you more. Father, I just pray that you have your way in this part of the service. In Jesus' name, amen.